We welcome you to today's webinar, Data Launching for Forest and Finance for June 2021. This webinar will be held in two languages, English and Indonesian. For participants who would like to hear the interpretation in Indonesian, you can click the globe icon on the bottom of your screen that says interpretation and click Indonesian. For participants who'd like to hear the webinar in English, feel free to select the interpretation icon and select English. Now I would like to talk about forest and finance. So this is an initiative supported by a coalition of several organizations, which comprises advocacy, campaign, and research organizations, namely Rainforest Action Network, Duke Indonesia, Profundo, Amazon, Amazon Watch, Reporter Brazil, Bank Track, Sahabat Alam Malaysia, and FOE. These organizations collectively try to create transparency and develop um, policies specifically, better policies, to push for better policies specifically in the financial sector. And we hope that financial institutions can prevent uh, the operational activities of their clients that will create risks to forest and the environment. This coalition uh, and platform, sorry, this platform was established in 2016 as a way to spotlight the financial sector's role in deforestation and rights violations. There are three main objectives that this platform aims to achieve, which is to provide an open source data set, data set linking financiers to companies connected to forest destruction and rights violations. Now we have six commodities. Secondly, we want to shine a spotlight on main banks and investors involved by evaluating and ranking their environment, social, and governance. And lastly, we want to hold the financial sector accountable by exposing client cases where there are operations that violate laws or policies. We will now to the main agenda. I would like to invite Agum from Tempo. He will be the moderator for today's discussion. Agum, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Linda. Hello, my name is Agum Wijaya. I am a journalist and I will be helping to facilitate today's webinar. We've heard earlier from Linda that today's topic is very interesting. It's very relevant uh, in our lives to continue to create prosperity, improve welfare. However, there are risks. We create risks not only to the environment, but also to our uh, interhuman relations. With many social conflicts uh, that are occurring. In today's webinar, we will see the most updated data and information from the Forest and Finance website. This is a public platform, a public data platform initiated by global CSOs from various countries to push for a financial industry that supports principles of sustainability. As we know, natural resources exploiting uh, businesses that affect surrounding communities, they, work, they are fueled by capital. They are supported by capital from financial sector, such as banks, um, investment funds manager, etc. The global initiative to push them to be pro to be more proactive in managing the environment, social and governance. These have all been started quite for, for quite some time. In Indonesia, the same issue has been um, 
raised from the beginning of the developments of financial institutions of the of OJK, sorry, the Financial Services Authority. Now we have a number of analysts here representing CSOs that have been overseeing this process, creating indicators and criteria, and also developing the ESGs, uh, helping to contribute to the ESG sector. First of all, we have Ambar Sari Dwi Cahyani from Responsi Bank. Hello, Ambar. Later on, we will hear from the Forest and Finance Coalition. We have Meryl Thundermark. Hello, good afternoon, Meryl. There's also Ward Warmerdam from Profundo, Jan Willem van Gelder from Profundo. And we will be speaking in Indonesia, uh, but you can use the interpretation feature. Some, the other, some of the speakers will be speaking in English and we have interpretation for that as well. We'll also hear from Eddie Sutrisno from Tuk Indonesia. Hello, Eddie. So ladies and gentlemen, we will have panelists to share about, uh, to respond to the presentations. I would like to again remind you participants to use the interpretation feature depending on the language that you need. Later on, if you have any questions, please type your question in the Q&A box. Please also include your name and organization and also who you'd like to address the question to. So without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, for our first speaker, Ambar Sari, to speak uh, on the point of view of Responsi Bank. Ambar, can you hear me? Go ahead, Ambar. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, greetings, and may peace be upon us. Good morning and also good uh, evening for those of you who are joining us from elsewhere. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I would like to share my screen. So can you see my screen? In this opportunity, I would like to, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I am part of the Responsi Bank Coalition, and also I'm a Sustainable Development Officer from the Prakarsa. Today's topic is bank policies for the forestry sector. So first of all, I would like to first explain about Responsi Bank Indonesia. This is part of the Fair Finance International and Fair Finance Asia. It is a coalition of 13 CSOs. Our objective here is to collectively, similarly with CSOs, is to push for financial institutions to implement sustainable finance by integrating uh, ESG principles in their credit and investment policies. Response Bank, with the coalition members, we also conduct assessment of policies of the financial institutions. Our reference is the Fair Finance Guide International or FFGI to assess banks' support in uh, implementing sustainability, promoting transparency and accountability in ESG. In Indonesia, the government's commitment to achieve uh, SDGs ha has been uh, uh, written into several documents. The government has stated that the ministry, the Minister of Finance has stated that in, amidst COVID uh, to implement green recovery to reduce carbon emission. This is this was stated during the high-level opening dialogue of the Green Climate Fund Private Investment for Climate Conference, October of last year. In Indonesia, we have also mapped the sectors or the areas that are the greatest contributors to greenhouse gas emission. 
since 2000 and Indonesia is committed until 2030 to reduce 29% or 41% of its uh, emission conditionally. So if we look here, uh, peat, uh, agriculture, um, and forestry sector contributes to the national GHG emission in Indonesia. I would like to go to the bank uh, policies. In Responsi Bank, especially our colleagues in Prakarsa, a number of researchers have done assessment on bank policies in pushing for sustainability. There are several themes in this, in this uh, assessment. There are several themes that we can see here on the screen. There are cross-cutting themes, sector themes, and also operational themes. Forestry is in the sector themes. I will continue by explaining about the forestry, uh, forestry element in the FFGI method. There are 14 points here, which I have summarized here. And we can see which are the most that the financial institutions have to push for. First of all, companies have to prevent negative impacts in HCF areas and HCS or high conservation value areas and high carbon stock areas. Companies must also prevent the use of timber that is illegally logged and traded in all of their timber supply chain. Companies must limit the use of chemicals and the pollution of uh, soil, water, and air. Companies must respect the rights of local and indigenous communities. Companies must prevent conflict on rights to land and obtain resources through FBIC processes. Certification for production and uh, plantation, they have to have certification for production and plantation forest in their timber supply chain. They must also uh, provide information on forest to the uh, carbon disclosure projects forest program. They have to, they have to, ish, they have to publish uh, their sustainability report and also integrate ESG criteria and compliance in their contracts uh, with suppliers. I will share with you. So here there are eleven banks assessed here by by uh, the researchers in Prakarsa in Responsi Bank's activities. There are um, national and international banks, which are Bukumpat in the assessment. So here I will share with you the five major banks. So first with BRI. From the documents that we have reviewed, published by the banks. So this is an assessment. We're conducting assessment based on what, uh, what the financial institutions uh, have published. BRI has a policy for providing loans with certification of environmental impact analysis and environmental management. BRI will not provide credit to businesses that degrades the environment, uh, national parks, and uh, and um, world heritage, or and it will not support fin financing for activities of land acquisition through violence. BRI has developed a policy that is environmentally friendly for the palm oil sector. Here in our assessment we stated that BRI's efforts must be appreciated. They have credit framework that prevents fin uh, the financing of businesses or activities that acquire land through uh, violence or by force. However, bank must ensure that this policy will be well implemented and refers to the FBIC principles. With Mandiri Bank, we have noted a commitment from the bank to become one of the pioneers of environmentally friendly bank. 
the bank has a policy to provide credit for businesses that are environmentally friendly and are committed not to provide credit or loans to businesses that degrades the environment, including th that threatens uh, cultural, uh, cult the culture, flora, and fauna, protected species. And we've noted that this has to be appreciated. There ha have been um, progress from this bank to create these commitments. However, the bank must also explicitly include in their, they must explicitly include this in their investment policies and also investment implementation. The next three banks, these are national banks, uh, Buku four banks. BCA Bank have conducted processes in which documents such as uh, environmental impact assessment, RSPO and ISPO certification, um, FSC certificates, these are requested from their clients. In our opinion, this is a good progress. FSC is stated as a document required to help assess uh, the financing process with BCA. Banks must push for the implementation of policies in the forest and land sector. For BNI, we only see that clients in the furniture industries, these are the ones that are included in BNI's policies in which they have to meet the eco-labeling and timber legality assurance system requirements. So this is something that has to be appreciated. However, bank must also uh, ensure that the forest and land sector policies cover greater area. For CIMB Niaga, they have done uh, preparations uh, they have prepared for mitigation in the forest and land sector. However, the bank does not have explicitly stated in their policies to anticipate the risks. It's not in their investment um, uh, policies. And it, the bank says that this is going to be started in 2020. So we hope that the bank can ensure that this commitment to it will be explicitly stated in the bank policies. From the seven national banks assessed, two, two of them do not have a specific statements for the forest and land sector. That's for the national banks. And because I have limited time today, so in conclusion, uh, just very broadly, in conclusion, the government is committed through their uh, development documents and as stated by the Minister of Finance, uh, am committed to reduce emission, carbon emission, to achieve climate resilient nation. However, the forestry sector contributes to 40 to 50% of the national uh, greenhouse gas emission. National banks have shown, uh, has begun to show commitments towards green or sustainable finance. However, it, this must be explicitly stated in their policies or implementation of their investment and has to be done uh, in a strict manner and CSOs will continue to monitor and push for the implementation, to improve the implementation. So that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amber. It's a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Now, we will hear from Metal, and then we who will, and then we'll hear from uh, Ward and Jan Willem, who will be sharing data from the forest and finance. Meryl, the time is yours. Thank you, Mas Agung, and greetings to everybody. So today, or actually yesterday, we launched a new website for the Forest and Finance Coalition. As Ma Linda was explaining, the Forest and Finance Coalition is, an organ is a coalition of eight civil society organizations, which aim to, to promote uh, transparency in the financial sector. 
And one of the ways we do this is by hosting our website, which has a lot of information about financial flows. So we've mapped transactions from financial institutions to companies operating in forest risk commodities. And that's a searchable database, which allows a lot of transparency to find out who is financing what. We've also done um, a detailed policy assessment, which since we are a coalition that focuses explicitly on forest and human rights related to um, forests, we have 35 criteria for this assessment, but otherwise it, it relates very well to the assessment that the Forest Finance Guide is doing. And on our side, we also have a, um, a section that documents all the impacts of social, environmental and governance impacts that part of this finance to the forest risk commodities is causing. So I'll show you some of the new features of our new website. Um, we had a website before, of course, but we have changed it a little bit to make it easier to search um, and to, to have a better understanding how these impacts and policies are connected. So the main database um, is a data deep dive page. Here you can find all the transactions that we've mapped since 2013 until uh, 2021 from um, financial institutions to companies operating in six forest risk um, sector commodities uh, that we've identified as being the main drivers of deforestation. So that would be beef and soy, palm oil, pulp and paper, rubber and timber in the three main tropical um, forest regions. So Southeast Asia, the Congo Basin and the Amazon Basin. Now in this data deep dive, we have up to 10 filters, which you can use to select your search. You can search by holding group, by subsidiary. Um, you can choose by ch search by financial institution, um, by the sector, by the region where the activities are taking place or by the region or country of the financial institution, among others. The results will be returned in the form of a table, which has every single transaction that was identified for your specific search. And then on top of the table, you have an overview graph with two tabs, one for the top investors and one for the top creditors that were identified for your specific search. You can download the results of your search if you would like to do more analysis of the specific transactions, for example. You can also choose to download the full data set if you make sure that all the filters are selected for all selected, and then you can do a, submit the search and download that full set which can be very useful if you would like to do your own um, more detailed analysis. Um, and you can create a link to your specific search, a URL, which you can share with colleagues. or you can use, for example, if you would like to write a blog and you would like to reference a specific search result. The data deep dive has a lot of detail though, and sometimes it's a bit, maybe too much. So we also have a quick view um, search page where you can get a nice overview of of how the financial flows in general go. So on this um, page, you can you have to choose if you would like to do a search by credit or by investment, and then you can choose two variables, and the results of this search will be shown in a tree map, which is like covers the whole universe of our uh, data. So for example, in this case, we've done a, a search for credits, and then with a subdivision by sector and by finance type. So the first result shows you the subdivision by sector. So you, just looking at this, you can quickly see that between 2013 and 2021, with, sorry, 2020, um, this has not been updated yet. Um, the vast majority of the finance went to three main sectors, pulp and paper being the one that received most credit and then followed by beef and palm oil. And you can see, for example, also that the timber sector, we've identified, <clears throat> we've identified far less credits for that sector. Now, if you click on any of these blocks, if, for example, you could click on the soy block, it would open a new tree map and there you would see the subdivision by finance type. So in this case, um, for example, it would show you that most of the credit provided to the soy sector is done in the form of corporate loans. Underneath this, you'll find a table which has the aggregated values of the finance provided per financial institution. So Banco do Brasil, for example, is the top one followed by Bradesco. These are Brazilian banks. Um, they've provided most credits um, overall. And you can also compare the policy scores that they have uh, received for the different sectors. So it's also an easy way to compare 
um, how good the, the scores are and compare how much, how exposed these specific financial institutions are. Below on, on, on the slide, it is page, pasted on the right hand side, but on the website you will find it below, are quick links that will take you to other parts of the, of the website. For example, other search parts, but also to the bank profile pages and uh, to the policy assessment. So you can quickly surf between the different parts of the website and complement information for your search. Another search option that we have is the compare the banks option. So here you can choose the financial institutions you would like to compare, and then it will give you the results of their total finance for the time frame that you've uh, determined with a breakdown by sector. So each color is a different sector. For example, the red color here represents palm oil and the orange represents pulp and paper. So you can quickly see that from these four selected um, Southeast Asian banks. May Bank, which is the bottom graph, is the one that has provided most credit, followed by Bank Mandiri. And in general, like May Bank and Bank Mandiri, for example, provide more credit to palm oil, whereas um, in the case of BRI, it has provided more to pulp and paper sector. Again, like on the previous page, below that you will find a table which has the aggregated amounts for the specific banks and the, the policy comparison. And you can see how they score, for example, on their policies for palm oil. Then there is the policy assessment page. On this page, we provide an overview of all the 54 financial institutions, both bank and investors that we have assessed. And you can, we will first, in the first column, you see a weighted total. So you can quickly rank them uh, on their overall score you will see again the total credit and investment that they have provided to forest risk commodity companies um, since 2013. So this gives you an idea of how exposed a specific financial institution is. It has the headquarters, and then you will see the policy scores for each of the six sectors that we have identified. So those, the policies are not always the same for the different sectors. Some, some financial institutions might have a good policy, for example, for the palm oil sector, but then that doesn't apply to the timber sector, for example. So it's important to look at the different sectors and how they adapt their policies to that. If you click on any of these uh, financial institution names, it will take you to the profile page of that financial institution where you will find more detail. So for example, in this case, you will see the top five forest risk clients. Um, for many financial institutions, you will also find the top five um, investees, so the main companies that they've invested in. And we have marked with a red dot those um, companies that are particularly controversial, be, for example, because they've um, received and they were the subject of an RSPO complaint or because they have been receiving a lot of bad media or, for example, because the Forest and Finance Coalition has published articles or reports about them documenting social environments and governance impacts caused by these companies. Below those top five clients and investees, you will again see the average policy scores together with a weighted total. Um, and you will see find more detail below on the average uh, scores per sector. And at the bottom, which in, again in, on the slide is pasted on the right hand side for the lack of space, but on the website you would find it at the bottom of that, are the detailed 35 criteria that we've used for the policy assessment. And again, you will see how the the financial institution scored on every single criteria for each of the six sectors that we've um, analyzed. And with that, I would like to pass it on to Bart. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen here. So, uh, Salamat Sore. Uh, thank you all for being here um, for participating in this webinar. It's very exciting to see the developments of uh, Forest and Finance now, a much more uh, data-driven website, which I hope is useful for your analysis and your advocacy work. So I'm going to talk about the update of the investor data. This is uh, adding on to the creditor data that already exists in the, the website. Um, 
and which was the last year we found that $161 billion had been provided to the six forest risk commodities in the three forest rich regions we were looking at. And still talking about that credit, um, about a quarter of that was attributable to beef, 20% of that credit went to palm oil, uh, 13% went to pulp, uh, sorry, a third went to pulp and paper and about 15% to soy. But now let's look at the, the updated uh, investor data, which is updated for the period uh, until the end of March of this year. The creditor data we will update again uh, in September. So what we found was uh, $45.7 billion had been invested in the forest risk uh, bonds and shares of the selected companies we were looking at. And here uh, we see about half of that, uh, of those investments were in palm oil. About 21% uh, or a fifth was in pulp and paper, uh, about 10% in rubber, which is not surprising given that a lot of palm oil companies also have uh, rubber on uh, their concessions, uh, um, have rubber concessions, and a much smaller amount of investments uh, by bond and shareholders in, uh, in soy and timber. Uh, again, unsurprising, about two thirds of those investments uh, were attributable to palm oil, uh, were, were attributable to Southeast Asia, and it's uh, unsurprising given the role of palm oil in, in terms of the investments. And about a third uh, of the investments uh, were in Latin America. Only a small percentage of the investments we identified can be attributed to Central and West Africa. Um, the largest investors are uh, that we found uh, globally uh, were government, uh, Malaysian government-linked uh, entities, so, uh, Permodalan National Bahard (PMB) and EPF, the Employees Providence Fund, and also Quap Retirement Fund. So PMB is a government-linked government investment vehicle, and EPF and Quap are both uh, pension funds. They're not the only pension funds on this list. We also see the Government Pension Investment Fund of uh, Japan, the Government Fen Pension Fund Global of Norway, also as uh, key investors. And the remaining are uh, BNDS from Brazil, the Development Bank of Brazil, and large um, US asset managers, uh, BlackRock and uh, Vanguard. And fidelity, among others. And the, the companies that received the most investments, uh, Sam Darby, big palm oil company I'm sure you're all very familiar with, uh, Susano, a uh, pulp and paper company from Brazil, and Top Glove, a rubber glove producer from Malaysia, which has profited a lot uh, from uh, the corona cri crisis and the need for rubber gloves. Uh, also making up the top four is JBS, a large beef company from Brazil. Now, focusing in on just investments uh, attributable to Southeast Asia, we see that about $30 billion uh, were invested in uh, Southeast Asia. And given the, the role of palm oil in Southeast Asia, it's not surprising that about three quarters of those investments were attributable to palm oil, uh, about 16% to rubber and a smaller amount to pulp and paper. This uh, smaller amount, uh, smaller investment in pulp and paper is because not all uh, pulp and paper, large pulp and paper companies in Southeast Asia are listed. So that's why we don't see a large uh, role there. Um, then in terms of where the financial institutions are coming from that are making these investments in Southeast Asia, around 65% or two thirds are actually coming from Asia and 55% um, are coming from Southeast Asia itself. So Malaysian, Singaporean, and the Indonesian uh, financial institutions primarily as we'll see. Uh, and around a fifth of the investments are coming from North America, primarily in the US, uh, a little bit from Canada and um, around 9% from, from Europe, with only 4% coming from, uh, from the EU countries. Um, focusing in on the investors themselves specifically, we see well, the top three are all Malaysian financial institutions, the government linked uh, entities that I just mentioned, and uh, also large uh, US asset managers, Vanguard, um, BlackRock, and also pension funds, uh, the GPIF the government pension investment fund of Japan is also among the top investors. In terms of companies that have received the most investments, uh, Sam Darby and Top Glove, like before, are ranking in the very top. Uh, but you also see other palm oil conglomerates like IOI and Batukawan. Batukawan is the parent company of KLK and uh, EPO. Uh, and also the Japanese company Itochu, which is uh, active in many of the forest risk uh, uh, value chains that we, we research. Uh, I should also note that these investments that we've identified are an increase over the values that we saw last year, 
Uh, so there's more uh, higher value of investments in quarter one of this year compared to quarter one of last year. This is partly because of the markets, uh, uh, the capital markets crash we had in March of last year due to the Corona crisis, uh, meaning that the share values were uh, much lower last year than, than they would normally have been. And a very big increase in terms of share value as uh, many invest investors have been going to the capital markets and also retail investors have become increasingly important uh, uh, players in, uh, uh, in uh, important investors uh, since many investors in Western countries have money left over that they didn't spend on, on holidays and things like that and seeing it as, and there's very low interest rates so they investing more in the capital markets. Um, that's it from me, I believe, and now I'm passing on to Jan Willem uh, van Gelder, Profundo, who will talk about the policy assessments. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all see my screen now. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit about the policy assessment we made uh, based on uh, the analysis of financing and investment data. We have identified the main uh, financiers, uh, not only investors, but also banks. And for these main uh, financiers, we have developed methodology to um, assess their policies. This, this methodology is very much uh, comparable to the, to the methodology uh, just explained by Responsi Bank, the Fair Finance International methodology. Um, it has many of the similar elements. Um, but um, is going into a bit more detail specifically on uh, issues related to uh, forest, to deforestation, etc. Um, it is based on international agreements, agreements made by the United Nations or the International Labour Organization, and also on uh, best uh, business practices. Um, in, in the community or in the business world, but also in the financial sector. So the uh, no deforestation, no peats, no exploitation policies, the principles for responsible investment, the OCD guidelines for multinational enterprises, etc. So based on these international agreements and international best practices, we have um, selected 35 criteria uh, in three categories environment, social, and government. So the environmental criteria, look at deforestation, uh, water, um, about um, high conservation value forest, about uh, protected areas, etc. The social criteria, look at uh, uh, human rights, especially of indigenous communities and, and other local communities affected by forest operations and the uh, labor rights of people working in these uh, uh, companies. The governance criteria deal with transparency, uh, uh, um, corruption, um, and also the instruments which are used by financial institutions to um, assess if companies meet their criteria. So these 35 criteria, we have uh, assessed the policies of, for now, uh, 54 uh, most important banks and investors. And we assess them separately for each of the six uh, main um, forest risk commodities, which are um, already mentioned uh, a few times uh, earlier. So, um, that is uh, palm oil, that's rubber, timber, pulp and paper, soy and beef. And for each of these commodities, we have looked at what are the policies of these financial institutions when they are active in these uh, sectors, because that can be different um, per 
commodity, what their policies are. Um, and we have also looked at their policies uh, for credits and their policies for investments, which can be also different. So um, assessing that separately, um, we came to scores for each of these six uh, commodities for each financial institutions. And then we combined these scores or for the six commodities, depending on how the banks and investors were exposed to these different commodities. So if a bank is big in palm oil and only small in timber, then its score on palm oil counts much heavier than its score on timber in the aggregate total score for these financial institutions. So, um, yes. This um, leads to an overview uh, like this, whereby I need to say that the, the basic uh, score we gave for each criteria was either a zero if it is not included in the policies of the financial institution or a 10 when it's completely covered, uh, but uh, and also uh, focusing uh, not only on the company invested in, but also on the suppliers of these companies and 8.5 as when the, the criteria is included in the policy, but the financial institution makes some exceptions and does not, for instance, cover the suppliers of the company they are fi financing. And um, because um, for each um, score, there is a uh, combination of the policies for uh, credits and the policy for investments, then the figures you are seeing here are not always um, 8.5 or 0 or 10, but also something in between. Um, so we create scores for each criteria on each uh, different commodity, and then we combine that in an aggregate uh, score for each financial institution. As I said, we have now uh, evaluated the 54 uh, most important financial institutions. Um, on the left side, you can see the scores, uh, the best scoring uh, financial institutions. So these are three uh, Dutch banks, ABN AMRO, Rabobank, and ING Group, um, the Government Pension Fund Global from Norway, Citigroup from the US, and two British uh, financial institutions, Standard Life, Aberdeen, and HSBC. Um, so, yeah, best scores are from uh, European and an American um, financial institutions. The, the local uh, financial institutions in Indonesia score uh, poorer. Um, as you can see on the right side, Bank Mandiri scores best and followed by Bank Central Asia, BNI and BRI. Um, I have to say we have not yet assessed all financial institutions in Indonesia. We are planning to do that. We are working on that. In September, there will be an update where we um, uh, expand the number of uh, financial institutions assessed from the present 54 to 200. Um, and that will also cover more financial institutions from Indonesia itself. So this is it for now. Thank you for your attention and I think I hand over to Mas Agum. Is that correct? Thank you, Meryl, Ward, and Jan. I would like to remind to the participants: you may ask your questions by uh, through the Q and A box. Please write your question and to uh, whom your question is directed. And then for the next speaker, uh, Bangun from Tuk Indonesia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Agung, for your time. Thank you for the time. Um, thank you to our speakers. We've heard from Responsibank, uh, Meryl, Jan, and Ward. 
as we know, this forest and finance data aims to look at the impact of the financial sector to the uh, investments in various sectors. There are several sectors in Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And I would like to talk about the case, a case taking place in Indonesia uh, with RGE. As we know, Royal Golden Eagle is controlled by the Sukanto Tanoto uh, tycoon family. This is a very famous uh, family in Indonesia. Their primary product is uh, pulp and paper and palm oil. But in addition, they also have numerous other businesses with very complex structures. The question is, what is the benefit of forest and finance data for uh, colleagues who want to do studies? Well, this forest and finance, through this data, you can see who are financing various company or groups such as RGE groups. You can also look uh, or conduct, you can do searches based on commodities. If you're looking on palm oil, for example, then you can do your search for palm oil. We can also uh, conduct searches based on company names. We found that the RGE group has received huge levels of financing from international banks. As I mentioned earlier, this company has, uh, it has um, pulp and paper and palm oil uh, commodities in very complex group structures. For the pulp and paper uh, structure, they have the April group for palm oil, they control the sector through the Asian Agri group. These two groups are very well known, uh, especially in times during fires, forest fires. I would like to talk about the impact of the company uh, operations, impact on the environment, social and governance issues. For the environment impact, um, the RGE group or pop and paper, they are supplied by about 16 suppliers with concessions totaling 1.2 million hectares. And from 2015 to 2019, these mills contribute to deforestation in about 47,000 hectares. And over 30% of the supplier concessions are located on peatlands. As we know, peatland operations will, you, will create um, or release greenhouse gases. And, this, and these are very uh, vulnerable to fires. The areas are quite vast, about 55,000 hectares, which burned in 2015 to 2019. These fires are closely linked to plantation industries, and these are a major cause of Indonesia's greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, in our identification, we found that mills uh, in RGE, these mills have been caught sourcing uh, palm oil from companies driving deforestation in Indonesia, such as in the Lucer ecosystem, which is in northern Sumatra, also, con also conducting conversion uh, in critical habitats for wildlife, like the Sumatran elephants and orangutans. And this, there's also social impacts. RGE has been involved in many land right uh, conflicts with local communities. For example, one of their mills, uh, a pulp mill, has affected the lives of about 3,000 families. There are, that's a huge number. In addition, during times of fires, RGE has been the main contributor to fires and haze, which has caused major uh, impacts on public health. Many researchers found that the fires in 2015 has contributed to 
100,000 excess deaths across Southeast Asia. This is not the, uh, the fires are caused not only by RGE, but also uh, others as well. But it's very huge impact. This is a port this is a photo of community member uh, resisting uh, land grabbing. Their farms were uh, taken for eucalyptus plantation. A 2020 report indicated that RGE has misidentified its pulp export under reporting their revenues in 20, 2007 to 2018. Uh, and this may have generated tax revenue in 168 million US dollars. And that's a quite a high number. And we still remember back in 2012, RGE received a 200 million US dollars tax penalty for systemic tax fraud and money laundering in its palm oil business. As I've mentioned earlier, in the forest, from the forest and finance data, we can identify the top 10 creditors of companies. So we looked at the top 10 creditors for RGE from 2016 to April, 2020. Here we can see that Bank of China is the, the, uh, the major creditor, followed by ABN AMRO, uh, CITIC, uh, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, First, Abu Dhabi Bank, uh, banks from China, uh, Mitsubishi from uh, Mitsubishi UFC from Japan, and they're also Taiwan banks. So, with the forest and finance uh, platform, we can identify the creditors for certain companies. What's important to note here is as we've heard from previous speakers about policies, it, what's important is the policies in each of these banks. These are linked to the types of companies financed by these banks. So if we look at here, for example, ABN AMRO, uh, Mitsubishi uh, Bank of China, and Industrial and Commercial Banks of China. So if we look here, ABN AMRO has uh, medium to good policies. For pulp and paper and palm oil, they have medium to good policies. For the environmental, social, and governance sector. However, if there are, imp although there are improvements in palm oil and pop and paper, this is not followed by other sectors such as rubber, timber, beef, and other, although there have been improvements. So we put them in the medium good uh, category. So if we look at the Bank of China, they have very poor uh, categories. So we classified the bank as very bad for all sectors, similarly with ICBC. The worst case is Citic. Um, they, they, their um, score was so bad that we couldn't generate a score for them. Now, what are the links of group um, policies with their uh, poor uh, uh, performance? When financial institutions have good policies, they can carry out uh, enforcement um, and push their clients to improve their operations. However, if these banks do not have good regulations, then they'll be they'll just um, turn the other the other way um, when there are violations. So palm oil does not mean that there's deforestation. In Indonesia, we know that there are numerous, there's a lot of deforestation during land clearing process for palm oil. People might ask, what is the link between beef and deforestation? In Latin America, these are closely linked because many for uh, because vast forest areas are cleared for for cattle uh, in the cattle industry. So, this is the approach that we did to look and to see how these financing risks. Um, creates risks to forest areas and others. So I think that is all my presentation. Agung, thank you very much. I think it'll be great if we can have further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paedi. So I see there are some questions, but let's um, park them for now. And before we go to the to the um, 
questions. Let's go to the panelists. Today, we have with us Ibu Tri Mutiari Melan, Team Sustainable Finance from BRI. Good afternoon, Ibu Tria. And we also have Abdullah, the Director Executive of Walhi in Jambi. We also invite representative from OJK to have a discussion with us this afternoon. However, uh, they are unable to attend. But if there are among the participants from OJK and would like to, sh to respond to the presentations or uh, ask questions, please do so for using the Q&A feature. And we've also actually invited representatives from financial institutions. However, to this afternoon, uh, we should appreciate the that BRI representative is here in this forum. Now, Ibutria, we welcome you to respond to the presentations. So earlier we saw that BRI score is still below that of Mandiri Bank, but still higher than uh, BCA and BNI. Please go ahead, ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the presentation that we have heard from the panelists. And from, and we would like to thank, uh, because to thank you for engaging us in the assessment process, as opposed to assessment pro for, to the as opposed to the previous assessment process, we didn't really understand what is it that was being, uh, what it was that was being uh, assessed. So if we look at the score, we did not. Uh, we do not see the score as something negative, something bad. This, uh, instead, for us, this is a, a motivation for us to increase our contribution or the policies that we need to improve to improve our ESG implementation. So, if we look at the value, yes, our uh, internally. We are still focusing on policies on palm oil. We hope that for our next target, we can fill in the gap with other sectors that are the concerns or causing impacts to the environment, such as pulp and paper. And uh, this has significant impact, right? And then as well as timber and rubber. These will be, um, we will consider this when developing our ESG uh, policies for these sectors. That is our overall response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Tria. Uh, we're very happy to hear the commitment, um, although these are not explicit com uh, commitment from the financial institutions, but we can see that there is willingness to improve. And this is a positive note for all of us. I would now like to invite, uh, so who should we go to here? Uh, from Walhi, our representative from Walhi. Uh, Duinato from Walhi, please, the floor is yours. Maybe your experience uh, in the site. My name is Dwi, representing Walhi. Unfortunately, Abdullah had other urgent uh, engagement. So uh, thank you very much to the panelists, for, sorry, to the speakers who have shared the, the work that they've done. And I think the contribution has been very, very good. In Jambi, 
while he has conducted has done intervention uh, as needed in jambi in jambi we are just beginning we try to seek active communication And we feel that in the various sectors with timber plantation and pulp and paper, and this is still in the planning process, we hope that in the future, this will be expanded. We hope that the activities, extractive industries, Uh, we'll, we'll be look at their financing. We are beginning, to, first of all, we are consolidating the information. And apologies, the speaker's audio is very poor. Uh, but that is all from us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dwi, representing Abdullah from Walhi Jambi, sharing information from our colleagues in Jambi. We will hear next. Sorry, now we will go to the questions. We'll read the questions uh, shared in the. Uh, so the queue, the questions coming in, we see. Uh, several questions here. I think, I hope that the panelists can also help respond to these questions. Um, and I hope that you, my colleagues here can help address these questions. Um, uh, who will respond to these questions? Uh, so first, we see from Sunario, question from Sunario, who asked, are there banks that provide credits for forest management. According to the news, bank uh, credits require collateral. Meanwhile, forests cannot be used as collateral. So are there no banks providing loans for forest management? He also asked, stating that 50% of bank finances goes for palm oil. And so I think it's not for forest management. So I think our colleagues, uh, Gun can help address these questions. So this forum, Forest and Finance, it is a coalition and public platform. It is not the name of the webinar. There are also several technical questions and some have been answered by chat. have been questioned by type. And uh, Meryl can also help uh, to explain about the technical aspect about how the public can use the, uh, the searches in the forest and uh, finance platform. And then lastly, we have a question from Geofani from Traju Foundation in West Kalimantan, who is greatly appreciative of the work of all the colleagues here. And he said to all the speakers, how do you strengthen advocacy based on the data, the finance data that we have here? So for, so after data collection, and we have conducted the a further analysis of the data available in the forest and finance platform. How do we advocate for this? How do we use that data to create greater impact? Uh, 
for advocacy purposes, whether it's to bank clients, companies, or financial institutions. So I would like to invite uh, Meryl uh, Gun or maybe uh, Ambarsari to help respond. Maybe Meryl should go first. Okay, Meryl. So we had the question as we've read earlier about the technical aspect of using the, the search. Please, Meryl. So Thank how you. to use the search in force and finance. Please go ahead, Meryl. Thank you. So the search in the first place is very useful to identify the financiers that are involved in financing a specific company, right? So if you if a local community is feeling the impacts of, for example, a palm oil plantation or a pulp and paper plantation that is encroaching on their land or that is causing deforestation, you can use a database and search by the name of that company. Or if you can't find it, you can try to search by the holding group company. And then you can identify which are the financiers that are financing, that are putting money into this company and that is causing deforestation. And that's the first step to identify and expose these financiers. Then you can, for example, first start by engaging with, with that financial institution, write them a letter, explain how you are feeling the impacts by the client that they are financing. You can ask the financial institution to adopt stricter policies um, and start an engagement. There's, of course, ways to escalate that. Um, shareholder resolutions, for example, have been quite successful with several financial institutions where, where shareholders actually pose a question and demand the bank or, bank or investor to adopt stricter policies. But that only happens after you, you create some exposure. And for example, media articles can also be very helpful to make the link between the financial institutions and the impacts that are being felt on the ground to make sure that there is a very direct link. It's not ab abstract. So I think that's, that's ways in which you can use the results of the search. Uh, you can also search for the policies, which is very useful to either identify if the the financial institution has very good policies, then you can say, look, you're breaking your own policies. You should not be financing this client. And you can ask the financial institution to stop financing or to impose restrictions on their clients. Or you, if the financial institution has very bad policies, you should, of course, uh, hold them accountable. Like your policies are not protecting against these impacts. You should adopt stricter policies because right now you're causing human rights violations and deforestation. So these are some ways in which you can use the data from the database for advocacy campaigns. Thank you, Meryl. Thank you. And um, now let's go to Gun for that first question. So are we? So is this palm oil or? or forests, you know, because they are creating impact on land. And okay. thank you, Agung. Thank you for Meryl also for answering that question earlier. So this, so we want to talk about the role of financial institutions in this industry. As we know, all industries have, all these industries have forests. So this is like, the fuel for for vehicles vehicles need fuel to move as meryl stated earlier we want to push for the responsibility of financial institutions we want them to take role and be accountable for their investment in the various sectors that they finance the major question here is how do we or why do we create forest and finance microsite, first of all, so that the public knows who are the financiers, uh, because it's too easy if we have someone in, uh, uh, involved in the investment, but they don't contribute to resolving any issues uh, that arise. In the context of business, and I think for all industries, they will always say if they don't have the policies in place they'll say you know so how are we going to how are we involved how are how can we intervene uh, on site similarly with the government if the government do not have regulations in place then they cannot regulate so that is why we are pushing for financial institutions to have uh, or to improve constantly improve their policies and we hope that all financial institutions have good policies in place so that we have 
tools to push them to enforce these policies, policy enforcement, uh, to enforce their policies. I have to also appreciate Butria being here. Uh, as we know, many financial institutions have policies uh, in place, but the, they are still poorly implemented. This is our duties. OJK should be here uh, and it is their role to regulate and so that we can create room or space for, uh, for discussion. If we look at AB and AMRO, they, have, they provide space for discussion with civil society. And if we can have that, that will be good for us to feed information to our colleagues in financial institutions. That's what we do in Tuk Indonesia and our colleagues. Uh, we feed them with information so that they know, so that they get information. And um, so, I mean, it's difficult for us to get uh, them to act if they don't know how to act. That's what we need help with from CSOs as well. If we have information, if we know these financial institutions or their clients are, are involved in these uh, violations, uh, we should feed them with that information. And then, uh, apologies, this interpreter cannot hear the speaker's voice. Okay, it seems that there is a um, I think Gun's uh, video. Okay, so financial, so so that financial institutions, and and we know that, as we know, long before deforestation in Indonesia is created by palm oil industries. We cannot separate. We can't just say it's this is palm oil. This is deforestation. It's no secret that the speed of deforestation in Indonesia, this is caused by these industries. And as I mentioned earlier in Indonesia, it's, it is a major challenge. OJK through its roadmap, this the roadmap actually creates a space and OJK should be able to optimize this roadmap. In my opinion, all financial institutions also need to create their spaces. Financial institutions cannot hide uh, behind uh, many other things. If all financial institutions such as BRI are willing to to have their representative uh, present for discussions, I think we can address many questions, many issues there. Thank you, Bangun. Uh, yeah, we also have questions from Kaum Telapak, uh, colleagues from Kaum Telapak and JPIK. So the question is, uh, he said that uh, force and finance data is very interesting. Is there any mechanism for the state-owned enterprise to give penalties to the corporation that violate the regulation or maybe through other instrument if the banks still giving investment or uh, finance is there going to be an audit for the banks? And then there's also uh, questions from Zainur. Is there any regulations that uh, for the banks, for, for them not to finance companies that degrading the environment? And if uh, these companies have proven to violate the environmental regulations and um, human rights violation, is there any penalties? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to answer the questions. It's a similar question, yeah? So, will the banks give penalties to the uh, violating companies? Well, we need to 
look at this um, business motivation. I mean, these companies is profit. These banks are uh, profit oriented and they understand that for a profit oriented uh, companies, there's a reputational risk. At current times, governance, uh, especially those related to the environmental and sustainability issues has become um, uh, an image of themselves. So finance sectors should also consider that. I agree with Bangun. He said that He said that banks and um, we, when we doing our advocacy, we can use this data provided by the FNF. And we can also communicate. If we see there's uh, something is just not right um, between the implementation and the policy, we can report that. To whom do we report this? The first is OJK. OJK need to know um, the implementation is not aligned with the policy. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, for banks in Indonesia, not all banks have explicitly have policy um, or explicitly have commitment towards the land and forest sectors. They may have the policy in the sustainability and annual report, but when we look at the policy uh, between the debitor and the creditor, it doesn't uh, explicitly say so. So, if the commitment is not explicitly stated, uh, it's going to be hard because it's not in a written form agreed by both parties. So I think we can use this data to push for, um, I, I, I mean, we can use this trend to push uh, for the deforestation issues and green development uh, issues, sustainability, uh, finance issue, uh, using the data from the forest and finance. We need to use this and uh, use it as our uh, advocacy. We have TRIA here, and it shows that it, a, a, a good progress. I realize that some colleagues from the finance institution is not um, open, but now we have TRIA here. It means that there's a progress and there's a progress of communication between the CSO and the financial institutions. That's all for me, Ago. thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we go to the next questions, there's another questions. Uh, that could be answered by Tria. The question is how banks can uh, capture uh, complaints from the community? Is there any grievance mechanism or is there any like complaint committee? If their uh, if their debitor uh, receive complaint, I think this is an interesting question. We know that our government is really pushing towards um, oh yeah, development, really trying to invite investors. And there's um, a lot of 
private investment that bringing risk for the environment. Uh, Tria can answer this uh, question because we know that a forest initially is uh, state owned. So how BRI manage this issue? Because in my opinion, if the central government told BRI to give credits to certain sectors, I imagine it will be hard for you to refuse that request. Um, yeah, maybe Tria and Mas Edi could uh, respond to this. Is there, um, is government is also one of the factors why we fail to implement this? But Tria, are you still here with us? Yes. Thank you for the question. If I may simplify the question. So basically, banking is highly regulated. There are a lot of uh, legally binding regulations. And we have internal or external uh, regulations. We also have audit that conducted regularly, both internally and externally. So cases like um, your questions is beyond my control, but I try to answer that. The process for credit approval has been done. And by implementing the sustainable banking, we, we will uh, consider the ESG risk in our credit uh, distribution. I cannot say that we have 100% um, implement this um, sustainable development because we are progressing uh, gradually, but we are moving towards that. We are trying to have the same standard amongst all banks. So I think regulator of the government is the one who have a role here. Thank you. Um, Mas Edi, do you have a, a response or comment? Can you highlight the question? Okay. Uh, let me repeat the question. Okay, like a Bank of China, they become the um, they 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 expand here and become like a representative for a China investment, and we know that the government of Indonesia are trying to um, attract investment. However, this investment could be risk for the environment and they could be a threat for the environment. And how about the implementation of ESG in Indonesia regarding to this investment and banks? Thank you. If we talk about uh, Jimbara, um, they have a clear regulations. There are a lot of regulations. There's a law for the government-owned enterprise, etc. Uh, yeah, I, in my opinion, it's a bit um, contradictory. Um, the target uh, development target of the the government and the SDGs target. We know that uh, the investment that the government made or the, 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 the development that the government made will not in line with SDGs goals. So 
So for colleagues in Jimbara banks, what I think we need is consolidation. Maybe not like a holding, but um, we just need to consolidate ourselves and we need to have a stricter regulation. And in the end, we can um, apply like a penalties system. So um, we hope that from the law enforcement or those who have the authority, uh, we in Indonesia, uh, we have, we do what we, we call the uh, compliance risk. However, uh, the issue in our uh, law enforcement, I, I take example of um, the oil palm. In the state law, it's clear that uh, they need to have concessions uh, to uh, become legal, not only the plantation permit, but what happens on the ground speaks differently. That's why I say that we need to uh, do a consolidation and we need to agree on things. I understand that in the context of business competitions, some say that we don't need to create new law. We, we, with the existing law, we can have a, a good business. Um, but however, we need um, to push for improvement. And this is exactly why we do this force and finance initiative. We want to see how this regulation and policy implemented on the ground. The highest sanctions that can be given is only like a warning from OJK. However, we consider this is not, a, a, it doesn't have a strong effect. In 2019, we have lost uh, so much. And I think it would not be fair if the financier did not get any penalties. OJK mentions about first mover, but we don't see the first movers really move. BRI is one of the first movers, and I hope that BV BRI can take leads in this movement. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bangun. Uh, for the last uh, question, I think it can be answered by Jan uh, Willem or Merrill or Ward. The question is, can you explain further why CITT or maybe the, the participant meant CT? Why CT receive a poor score? Thank you. And then the second question, what about um, the companies that has not yet listed? So maybe colleagues from Forest Finance can respond to these questions. Meryl or other colleagues? Hello, Meryl or Jen? Yes, hello. Um, I could try to answer. I, I don't know the first question, which bank was actually mentioned there? Citigroup from the US or? Um, so Citigroup is actually one of the banks having a relatively good policy. Um, um, yeah. So what can I say? Uh, I think they are scoring fairly good on, on, on various uh, criteria. Uh, improvements are possible both by adopting uh, more criteria, but also uh, exp 
extending their um, due diligence when it comes to checking their criteria to not only the companies they are financing directly, but especially also the suppliers of these companies. Many, um, many uh, financial institutions um, forget to make that into the into their policies. And, and we all know that um, in, in these forest industries, suppliers play a big uh, role. And it's often, um, and it also brings the question to the unlisted companies. Suppliers are often unlisted, uh, supply to bigger companies in the, uh, who are listed on the stock exchange. And it is important that these supply chains are, are checked uh, very well and that there is um, an effort being made to to make sure that uh, deforestation is stopped in these supply chains that human rights are expect, uh, respected there and many financial institutions still uh, don't see that and only focus on on the companies they are financing directly and not on their supply chains um, but maybe the question was indeed not about Citigroup but about Citic from from China who's scoring a zero. Um, yeah, I think uh, the answer there is that they are lacking uh, policies and um, uh, still are far behind also behind the Indonesian banks um, in, in developing policies on this field, although they are financing uh, uh, companies in these um, sectors. And um, the other question about uh, unlisted companies and, and what about uh, that? Um, the data we have now provided, the financial data we have presented in this webinar are only the investment data. So the, uh, the investments in shares and bonds of listed companies. Uh, the Forrester Finance website also has a very large part on credits, um, which are covering a period from the last four years. Um, credits, loans, and other types of credits which are giving both to listed companies, but also to unlisted uh, companies. And um, so um, in that respect, also unlisted, uh, non-listed companies are covered in the Forest and Finance uh, website. And you can find data on which banks are providing uh, loans to these uh, companies. I hope that has answered the questions. Okay, thank you uh, for the response, Ian Milan. It's already one and a half hour. There are some questions. Um, and based on that questions, we can see that a lot of people pay interest to our topics. We have the data from the forest and finance, and they also conduct assessment. They engage with banks uh, in their assessment process. And I think this is a good, not only control for the banks, but um, the public can also use this data to also monitor the implementation um, of a good uh, governance and a good um, environmental policy. I will not uh, make any conclusions um, on our discussion. As a reporter myself, I'm really interested to see how what we can do together further. Um, we have this data that is publicly accessed uh, by public and journalists and CSO. And it will be very interesting what we can do with this data. Uh, I will end the discussion session and I will uh, give the floor back to Linda. Thank you so much, Mas Agung, for moderating our discussion session. And I would like to also uh, thanks all the speakers and panelists and all the participants that join with us in this webinar. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to apologize for